Well, here we are, boys and girls, the final part of the Digimon World Trilogy on PS1. As I previously brought up in the last two videos, Digimon World is a strange series as each game is vastly different from the other. Being disconnected story-wise and completely changing the core gameplay between games. The first is a pet raising action RPG, the second is a roguelike dungeon crawling turn based RPG, and the final game is a more traditional JRPG, simplifying some of the ideas from the second game, but bringing in old ideas from the first game and maybe borrowing a little too much from its competitor Pokemon. So let's get into it. Well, actually before we do, this video will focus on the US release of Digimon World 3. I'm aware there's a PAL version known as Digimon 2003, which makes some changes and adds some things to the game. But I want to talk about the game I played back in the day. I will discuss the differences between them later on though. In Digimon World 3, you now play as Junior, a kid excited to play the virtual reality MMORPG known as Digimon Online. He logs into the game with his friends Teddy and Ivy, and the trio pick a team of Digimon to control and play the game. The game's plot, at least initially, should sound pretty familiar, as Junior will strive to become the best Digimon tamer, like no one ever was. He'll travel across Asuka server, searching far and wide, teaching Digimon to understand the power that's inside, with the goal of defeating the four server leaders, obtaining their badges, and becoming Digimon World Champ. Yeah, it's more or less Pokemon's to be a master goal, but to the game's credit, that's not all there is to it. But I'll circle back to the story a little later. First, let's focus on what's new in Digimon World 3. First and most obvious are its graphics. The game is mainly a mix of 2D sprites and pre-rendered backgrounds. NPCs and Digimon on the overworld making use of detailed 2D sprites. The pre-rendered backgrounds are similar to the ones in Digimon World 1, with a nice mix of nature and technology, looking even better than the first game, and really pushing what the PS1 was capable of. And honestly, it's a breath of fresh air over the boring look of Digimon World 2. But it's not all 2D as battles will still make use of 3D models for Digimon. They're more detailed and proportioned compared to the previous games, with different scales and size depending on the Digimon. Though I wish the camera was pulled back a little bit during the battles, if only because certain Digimon are so big they end up taking up half the screen. Unlike its predecessor, you now have an overworld again, like you did in the first game. So you're not limited to one city and the same boring dungeon design used for every level. You don't have as much freedom with exploration like you did in the first game though, as you can't access certain areas without progressing the plot. And unlike before, with the exception of a few static Digimon, all Digimon encounters are now random battles like a traditional RPG. I know not everyone is the biggest fan of randomized battles, but I don't mind them at all. Honestly, I'd say Digimon World 3 is one of the better games with an encounter rate as I can usually travel pretty far through an area before triggering a fight, as opposed to a fight every couple steps like the genre is usually known for. Though there isn't some item that will let you skip fights entirely, which doesn't sound like a problem at first considering the fair encounter rate, but it can be very frustrating later in the game, which I'll get into later. On the topic of fights, they've been simplified compared to the last game. You still get control of three Digimon in your party, but now battles are one-on-one -on -one instead of three-on-three, -on -three, and random encounters with wild Digimon will only ever have you facing one Digimon per battle. But fights with other teamers can go as high as three. You have a few options on how to approach a battle. First is the standard fight command, which lets you hit an opponent with a regular physical attack. Next is tech, which lets you use a special move for the cost of MP. Techs tend to do more damage than a regular attack and are split up into physical, special, or support moves. Some come with different elemental attributes, have the chance to cause a status effect, can heal your Digimon, or can be used to buff your Digimon or the rest of the party. Depending on which Digimon you have, they'll learn a new tech around every 5 or 10 levels. Also once your Digimon's Digivolution hits certain levels, techniques can be loaded allowing other Digivolutions to use those moves at the cost of higher MP. 
abbreviated as DV in the menu, Digimon can digivolve while battling, and it works closer to the show than it did in the previous games. Digivolution isn't permanent like before, though you can choose to have your Digimon come out to a preset Digivolution, as opposed to starting a fight as a rookie each time. Each of your rookies can save up to three Digivolutions to use in battle, needing you to go to an NPC in cities in order to swap between forms. So while your party is limited to a team of three, you technically have up to 12 Digimon you can use in battle. Your Digimon will unlock its base or normal Digivolutions as they level up. And when I say normal Digivolution, I'm referring to what you'd expect your Digimon to normally turn into. For example, Geomon to Growlmon, to War Growlmon, and finally to Gallantmon. You unlock your normal champion when your rookie reaches level 5, Ultimate at level 20, and Mega at level 40. Those Digivolutions will level up separately from your rookie, usually at a much faster rate and depending on its stats or level, go on to unlock different Digivolutions. You also have the option for Blast Digivolution and DNA Digivolution. Blast Digivolution works by filling this gauge underneath your Digimon's HP, either through taking damage in battle or using a specific item to increase it faster. Once it's full, your Digimon will instantly warp Digivolve to its most powerful form and make use of its signature move for three turns. It gets more use during the early game, as it works as a crutch if you're getting your ass kicked. Though it does take a while to fill up. DNA Digivolution is different from what it was in the last game. In Digimon World 2, it basically worked like breeding, combining two Digimon to create a third, whose level cap would go up and who would inherit the moves of its parents. Here it's just like the anime, where you combine two Digimon to temporarily create a stronger Digimon. To actually use it, you first have to tag in another partner. If the two Digimon you're switching between can combine, you can activate DNA Digivolution. This will summon a more powerful form who instantly attacks before switching to the Digimon you tagged in. You'll get more mileage out of it than Blast Digivolution, as it's more reliable to pull off. And then the last two options in battle are to either give it some items to help it in some way, or just running away. With your speed stat determining if you can flee right away, have to wait a turn, or if you're stuck in battle. Overall, the battle system is a step up from the last game. Fights are much faster since you're not fighting multiple opponents at once, and they come off as a little more lively, as you'll have an actual background your Digimon will stand in while fighting, as opposed to the boring void of Digimon World 2. Your base rookie also levels up much faster, so you don't need to go through a certain amount of fights for your underleveled Digimon to catch up. Unfortunately, their Digivolutions do still follow that rule. So, rather frustratingly, it will still take a set amount of fights to get up a set amount of levels. But fights don't really have a lot of strategy to them. While you still have debuff moves, moves that can cause status effects, and moves that let you counter enemies for more damage, almost all fights in the game really just boil down to trading blows. Almost no tamers or wild Digimon use anything close to an actual strategy. So, like how I play Pokemon, I just focus on hitting them hard and ending the fight fast. This problem with a lack of strategy is best exemplified by the server leaders. While they serve the same purpose as gym leaders in Pokemon, defeating them to get a badge and advance the plot, they don't stick to a single typing or move strategy, just using stronger versions of Digimon in the immediate area. So really it's just about grinding your Digimon up and equipping them with the best gear. In fact, I feel like most bosses in the game, especially later on, end up being more of a stat and gear check than anything. Now let's organically segue into your Digimon stats. The way your stats work in this game is pretty similar to the first game. First working as a way to determine what your Digimon will Digivolve into, and second in that you can train these stats individually outside of your standard level up. You have the regular RPG staples of HP and MP for health and magic respectively, strength which is the power of your standard physical attack, defense which decreases physical damage, Spirit, that has the dual role of increasing the power of magical attacks and lowering damage you receive from magical attacks, kind of like Special in Gen 1 of Pokemon. Wisdom, which affects the accuracy and evasion to magical attacks. And probably your most important stat, Speed. It affects the accuracy of your standard attack, your evasion rate, your turn in battle, how many attacks you get in a turn, 
and as I mentioned before, your success rate in running away in battle. Then you have Charisma, which works as a sort of level gate for teamer and card battles. And finally, Elemental Resistances, which decrease the damage from a given elemental type. All these stats will level differently based on what rookie you're using, but the main focus is to train them up at gyms scattered across the world. After leveling up your Digimon, they'll gain TP, or training points. You'll spend those points at the gym with the options of 1, 5, or 10 TP training. Then a little animation of your Digimon training will play with a chance of succeeding or failing randomly. Gaining more stat boosts the more they succeed, with a chance of a bonus at the end. As far as I can tell, the success rate really is random, and most players agree that 5 TP training seems to have the highest success rate. Annoyingly, certain stats like your elemental resistances can only be trained at certain gyms, which are scattered far away from each other and far from towns too, so they can be a hassle to get to at times. And outside of training your stats, you can increase them with gear like your typical RPG. Armories are scattered around the various towns you can visit, all of them run by a Gargamon. There isn't much to it really. Unlike other RPGs, there aren't any special bonuses on your weapons outside of increasing your stats. So you always want to get your team fully geared up with the best items you can afford. The only real problem is how long it can take to accumulate money. Digimon battles don't drop much, and you can't refight Digimon tamers over and over again either. So it's going to take some grinding to afford new gear. You'll occasionally find some equipment in a present box in the wild, but they're very rare compared to other RPGs. Battles have a low chance to drop some items, but they're never equipment. Usually just a healing or debuff item, or if you're lucky, an accessory. There's one way the game tries to help, in the form of a secret auction, but I'll cover that when I talk about the side quests in the game. And before I circle back to the story, I'll randomly throw in my thoughts about the game's music. Unlike the first two games, the soundtrack here really didn't grab me all that much. It's not that the music is bad or anything, I just consider the others better but there are a few tracks I really enjoyed. The standard battle theme is pretty good. The two boss themes have a nice intensity to them. Suzaku City probably has the best theme of the four cities. It also reminds me of Breath of Fire 4. I like that game a lot. And I really like the upbeat sound of the training theme. Now I was going to leave it at that, but holy shit, I had a revelation while listening to this game's music. Have you ever had a song or theme stuck in your head for years? Humming it to yourself from time to time, but not really remembering what it was? Well, I've had. And as it turns out, it comes from this game. And it's theme that plays when your Digimon gets confused. Also going by Gekkomon's theme. <laughs> I wish you could have seen my face when I heard this song. My mind literally blown as the song I thought was from Looney Tunes or some wacky 90s cartoon came from Digimon World 3 of all places. Absolutely insane. Alright, now let's get back to the story. As I said earlier, the setup is your playable character Junior along with his friends Teddy and Ivy signing up to play Digimon Online. Before logging into the game, you'll first have to decide a username for Junior. A nice take on naming the main character whatever you like and justifying it in story. And you'll also decide which team of Digimon you want. You'll have your choice of three packs, Balance, Powerful, or Maniac. The Balance pack is made up of Kodamon, Renamon, and Patamon. A well-rounded team with a physical attacker, magic user, and healer. The Powerful pack is made up of Monmon, Agumon, and Renamon. 
a purely offensive based team. And finally, the Maniac Pack, made up of Kumamon, Gilmon, and Patamon. They're described as quirky and difficult, with Kumamon fitting the role of a tank, Gilmon as a support user, being able to buff himself and the party, and Patamon again as the healer. This would be the pack I ended up using for this run. While you're locked to these three Digimon for most of the game, you can recruit the others later on through a side quest, along with an 8th Digimon you couldn't get in any of the packs. Once you're fully registered, you'll be logged into the virtual world of Digimon Online. Using these strange matrix devices that kind of remind me of the Saiyan pods from Dragon Ball Z. It's something that kind of confused me as Junior logs into Digimon Online, is whether it's still its own separate digital world, with its own life forms like the previous games in the anime, or if it really is just an interactive virtual online game now. It leans more towards it just being a game at first, but certain events later in the game make it clear Digimon are still sentient creatures. Once you're logged into the game, you'll start your journey in Asuka City. Here the game does a good job introducing you to its world, its new concepts, and even gives you a tutorial battle to get the hang of the basic fight mechanics. You're given the goal of heading east to Seriu City to challenge its leader, and from here, you'll have to do things on your own. For the first few hours, it really does just follow the Pokemon model of leveling up your team, unlocking new forms, and getting badges from leaders. Though it's nowhere near as linear or as simple like in those games, which I'll get into later. Around the time you collect your second badge is where the plot dramatically shifts. Ivy, or Kale as she goes by in-game, will show up and suggest that they've spent enough time online, and now's a good time to log off. Junior will agree and the pair return to the administration center, where they find out that extended maintenance is making it so no one's able to log out. After some undercover sleuthing that involves dressing up as Agumon, the pair discover that no one can log out due to the machinations of the super hacker, Lucky Mouse. Or so we're led to believe, because as it turns out, the true villains are the cyber terrorist group known as AOA. What's AOA stand for? Not a clue. It's never explained in game and searching for it online, all people have are theories of what it could stand for. Huh, the story of someone being trapped in an online game due to the schemes of an evil third party? Why does that sound familiar? <laughs> ah, right. Dot hack. Okay, it's not exactly the same plot, as there is nothing in the game that hints that teamers are even capable of dying online. But it is kind of funny to think about. A Digimon game of all things had the whole trapped in a virtual world plot before Dot Hack or Sword Art Online. The goal now shifts from being the best Digimon tamer, like no one ever was, to stopping AOA and their evil plans. This involves Junior traveling to other cities and a whole other server, unmasking their leaders, and finding out the truth behind their evil plan. And what's their evil plan exactly? He mentioned something interesting. Cypher is pursuing new research. He claims that what they're doing in Africa is the missing piece. A weapon to surpass Metal Gear. Or something like that. They plan to use their artificially created Digimon, Vemmon, to fuse with their powerful battleship and destroy the forces of the world. Though there's more to this plan than it seems. If it sounds like I'm giving a very abbreviated version of the story, well, there's a good reason for that. I had initially planned to go through the story bit by bit like I do in other videos, but I realized it would cause this video to drag on. And because of how insufferable it would be due to the insane amount of padding in this game. Which of course brings me to the biggest criticisms I have about this game. Grinding and padding. Now grinding I honestly don't consider it to be all that bad. As I've discussed in the Digimon World 2 video, I'm someone who plays a lot of JRPGs, so grinding in a game doesn't really bother me all that much, and honestly, I'd say the grinding in the last game is worse than the one here. As in Digimon World 2, your Digimon had a level cap, so you'd grind out, go back to town, fuse it with another Digimon, and start the whole process again. But here, thanks to a better designed world, close to no loading screens, and really fast fights, Grinding doesn't feel like it takes anywhere as long. The problem really stems from the fact that just about every time you enter a new major area, you have to grind your team up again to stay competitive. 
or else get stuck in long fights. Or get your ass kicked. Made worse in that some areas will have one enemy that is much stronger than your current team can reasonably handle, either forcing you to learn that lesson the hard way with your team wiping, or begging the RNG gods to let you run away from it. There are a few accessories you can find that will help you with the XP gain, but it's pretty late into the game. But because of the way you unlock Digivolutions, you don't have to focus on your entire team, and could just level up one partner if you really wanted to. The padding on the other hand, I have no excuses for, and honestly made it a real chore to record for this video. So just about any time you have a set goal, instead of letting you just do it, the game will pad out the whole experience with a ton of backtracking. For example, and probably the most infamous of it in the game, trying to get to Suzaku City. After beating the first server leader, Serio Leader, yeah he doesn't have a name, just a title, he tells you to head to South Sector and challenge the Susaku leader next. How do you get there? Well, there's a convenient gondola that can transport you there in the nearby kicking forest. But when you get to it and try to operate it, it turns out you need a special blue card in order to use it. No, not that one. Though it's an obvious reference to Season 3 of Digimon. A nearby NPC will tell you where to get one, specifically from a Geomon. So head all the way to Asuka City, and once you get there, you'll find him at the inn. Talk to him, and he doesn't have one. But his cousin does. Alright, well, where the hell is he? Geomon says his cousin is on his way to Seryu City, but that he might make a pit stop to get something to eat on the way. Okay. Head through the wire forest and eventually find the forest inn, where the second Gilmon is. But this asshole doesn't have it either. But some other Gilmon in Seryu City does have it. Okay, fine, whatever. Head back to Seryu City and the shady acting Gilmon will finally give you the blue card. Go back to the gondola now and try to use it. And of course, you've been bamboozled. On close inspection, this is actually an 8 Lu card and not a blue card. Which, if you check your key items beforehand, you would already know, but the plot's gotta happen. Head back to confront the same Gilmon from before, but a different Gilmon is there, and tells you the bad one ran off somewhere, giving you a hint on where to go. Head to the Forest Inn's basement, confront him, and finally get the real blue card. Now you can finally get to South Sector. Take the gondola and, whoops, unexpected unskippable boss fight! Hope you remember to save, because Bulbmon hits like a truck and takes a ton of damage. Oh, and to rub it in, the bastard doesn't even give you any XP or money. Alright, finally you're in the South Sector. A new area to explore with new Digimon to fight, so it should be smooth sailing to Suzaku City, right? Of course not. If you head south, you need to travel through the Jungle Grave in order to get to Suzaku City. But it's being guarded by the mega-level Digimon Zambamon, who's an unwinnable fight as your Digimon will run away from him in battle. Okay, so how do we get past him? We need the help of the Shaman Digimon Sepikmon, who has something that will get rid of Zambamon. But before we can get that item from him, we need to get his mask back because he can't be seen without it, like he's the Phantom of the Opera or something. Where's his mask? He's not sure, but he had it with his friend Baronmon. Baronmon being all the way back at Protocol Ruins. So when you find and talk to him, he says he actually saw his friend Sepikmon back at Asuka City. Head back there, Find out he's causing trouble, and eventually unmask the fact that Edamon stole the mask. Eventually confront Edamon, get the mask, go back to Sepikmon, get the smelly herb, and finally get past Zambamon. I really hope I'm getting my point across here. This game is constantly sending you back and forth between areas, sometimes as far back as the first city in order to do things. And mind you, there is no fast travel, and nothing that lets you avoid random battles so it's painfully slow getting from place to place. It tries to make this a little easier when you unlock Sabarimon and Digmon in order to travel through the map, but this still has its problems too, as it's more like a shortcut than quick travel, and you still have to fight Digimon underwater and on the circuit board. This problem is made far worse later on when you leave Asuka server for Amaterasu server. After getting there the first time, the only way to travel between the two servers is using these holes on the map using Digmon. But the circuit board looks too similar, 
doesn't have any real landmarks to figure out where you're going, and outside of some helpful Digimon down here, it's way too easy to get lost. So you may end up wasting more time getting lost using the shortcut than taking the long way at times. Now, some of you might be thinking, but Fuzzy, plenty of RPGs pad themselves out with quests and stories in between the main objectives of the game. And yes, this is absolutely true. But the problem is that other games do it so much better. I'll use Pokemon for comparison, specifically the original Red and Blue. After getting your first badge from Brock and Pewter City, your next goal is to head to Cerulean City and challenge Misty. This requires you to go through Mount Moon first before getting to her. It's a fairly straightforward path through it, most trainers are skippable fights, and has you encounter Team Rocket for the first time before you leave the area. But once you leave Mount Moon, it's a straight shot to Cerulean City, and assuming you don't head north to the Nugget Bridge to challenge your rival, you can face Misty right away. See how it's worked more organically into your journey? Instead of the, okay, go here, but first do this, okay, now go, lol, you can't do this yet, go find this other thing first, approach of Digimon World 3. I wouldn't be bothered by it so much if it was just a one-off, but it happens after every single story beat in game, so it can feel so tedious. Again, hindered by the fact you have no real fast travel or item that lets you avoid random battles. My experience would have been completely soured because of this if it wasn't for one thing. So let's go ahead and segue into the side quests and kick off with the best one in the game. It's time to do, 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 do. Gwent. That's right, Digimon Card Battle. Oh my god, this game is addicting as all hell. Needless to say, it's based on the IRL Digimon Card Game, whose cards I like to collect as a kid. Never could figure out how to play, but I always really loved the art of the cards. Now I have no clue how close the actual rules of this game are to the real deal, but the rule set here is fairly standard. You can create a folder of cards made up of Digimon and program cards. This serves as your deck. When a card battle begins, you choose between two face down cards, and whoever draws Calamon gets to go first. Next you and your opponent will draw 6 cards from the deck. Once your hand is full, you have the option to load a program card. In this phase, usually used to draw more cards or search your deck for a specific Digimon. The summon phase comes next, allowing you to play any Digimon from your hand onto the field, assuming you have the required energy for them. Each Digimon in your hand is worth a point of energy, corresponding to its card color. Each Digimon has a cost for summoning too, with rookies usually costing nothing, champions costing one point of energy, ultimates costing two, and megas costing three. Once you have your Digimon on the field, you enter the Compile phase, where you can use any remaining program cards. Cards that boost your Digimon stats or let you search your deck at the cost of discarding another card from your hand can be played here. With all that done, you'll enter the Battle phase, both sides tallying up their cards' collective health and attack points. Both sides then smash into each other, and whoever hits zero health first, loses. The winner wins the first set, and whoever wins best two out of three wins the whole game. I think what I enjoy so much about it is how simple it is to play and how fast matches can end. Depending on how you build your deck and what opponents you're facing, most games will end in the first turn. So they don't draw out all that long compared to more complicated card games. If anything, I'd say the real challenge comes from building a good deck. You have three ways of attaining more cards. First, by winning booster packs from opponents you beat. Second, by straight up buying the cards from Divermon. They'll usually have stronger cards, but tend to be very expensive. And finally, by beating Cardmon. Cardmon can only be found in kicking trees or fishing for them. They aren't very difficult to fight, but they have a habit of running away in battle. So you want to finish them off as fast as you can. Any booster packs you obtain can only be opened up by Divermon. Same goes for editing your deck. Along with challenging tamers out in the world, you can travel to a secret location known as Duel Island. Here, you'll fight tougher opponents and win trophies that let you take on even tougher tamers as the game goes on. It's a pretty effective loop of building a deck, challenging tamers, and winning cards to build a better deck. I don't remember how the actual Digimon digital card battle on PS1 actually holds up in comparison to this side quest, but I may take a look at it in a future video. The side quests for the fishing rod and the kicking boots directly tie into card battling. You'll get the fishing rod by getting the necessary parts for it and bringing it to an old man on Shell Beach. While the kicking boots can be obtained by helping a kid get his Gabumon card back. As thanks for getting him his card, he'll tell you to seek out Vimon in the kicking forest. 
who will give them to you after a game of hide and seek. Now let's go over some of the remaining side quests before I wrap up my thoughts. Outside the card game, the biggest side quest will be expanding your Digimon team. Around the time you get your second badge, mysterious NPCs known as DRI agents will start appearing on the world map. Talk to them and they'll ask for the DDNA of a specific rookie Digimon, which you can only obtain by hunting down and fighting their ultimate forms. Beat them and return to the DRI agents and they'll give you the corresponding rookie, letting you swap out your team members when visiting Dr. Kodomatsu or Piximon, with Vmon being the 8th Digimon you couldn't choose from the original 3 packs. The other side quests are all about getting exclusive and legendary gear for your Digimon. The first way is through the secret auction. In order to access it, you first have to be able to get into the El Dorado, a club right next to the card shop. You do this when your Digimon's combined charisma hits a certain level. There isn't actually anything to do in El Dorado itself, but if you take the exit near the bottom of the club, it'll lead you through a secret tunnel and the location of the auction. Throughout the game, there'll be several auctions held for rare and Digimon-specific items. The items tend to be better than what is sold at the armory at the time, with some auction items available much earlier than you could actually buy them. They're also a little more affordable as well. The only real catch is that you won't know that an auction is active unless you come back to Asuka City to check and that the item up for auction might not be usable by someone on your team. The next way to get legendary weapons is through a crafting side quest. Throughout the story, certain boss Digimon will give you an old weapon after defeating them. The stats on them aren't anything special, but if you find the right corresponding Digimon, they'll be able to upgrade it for you. Honestly, it doesn't feel worth the hassle as the Digimon who will upgrade them are randomly scattered across both Asuka and Amaterasu's server, you have to buy another weapon in order to upgrade the first, and upgrade it several times to get it maxed out. And like every weapon in the game, it's just stat buffs with no extra special effects to go with them. Now the final way to get legendary gear, specifically armor, is through hunting down Black Digimon. Black Digimon are hidden bosses that will pop up around the time you get to the Amaterasu server. Nothing special to them, just beat them to collect the gear. Alright, I think I've covered just about everything. I'm aware there's a PAL version known as Digimon 2003, which makes some changes and adds some things to the game. But I want to talk about the game I played back in the day. I will discuss the differences between them later on though. Oh right, the differences between the two versions of the game. So there are two versions of the game, Digimon World 3 in the US, and Digimon World 2003 in Europe, and Japan. Though it's still called Digimon World 3 in Japan. I'm not going over every little difference between the two games, but the major ones are as follows. First is that there's an actual post game in 2003, as when you beat the final boss in the original game, that's it. Roll credits, get a small post credit scene of the kids logging back into Digimon Online, but then you just return to your last save file. In 2003, you'll log back in and play a sort of test game on the fixed Amaterasu server which loses its evil color palette and looks normal again. You're limited in what you can do, but you can return to the goal of collecting badges and fighting the world champion. This time fighting against the Amaterasu server leaders who were kidnapped by AOA. Next is some balance changes, specifically regarding an accessory known as the Counter Crest. The Counter Crest randomly drops off of Tuskmon when in the Northern Badlands in West Sector, roughly around 10 hours into the game. It's an insanely powerful item that pretty much breaks the game, as when equipped to your Digimon, they'll instantly counter physical attacks, doing the same or more damage than their attacker. Naturally, you still have to survive the attack and actually hit them with your counter, as they can still evade, but it makes a joke of some of the more powerful bosses. 2003 lowers the counter rate from 100% to 50%, making it less reliable. Then it's small things like limiting how many times you can fish in an area before you have to leave and come back, setting a damage cap of 9,999, though you don't really need to hit harder than this to win fights, and finally increasing the chances for critical hits, dropped items, and the chances to get ambushed in battle. To sum up my thoughts, Digimon World 3 fixed a lot of the issues I had with the previous game. The RPG mechanics were fleshed out better, the boring dungeon design was replaced by a vibrant and colorful overworld. Fights were completely redone, making them a lot faster. 
You have side quests now that give you something to do in between the main story. Ones like Digimon Card Battle are so fleshed out and addictive, you may end up spending more time playing the card game over the actual game. Digivolution was already straightforward in the last game, but here, leveling up is just like you'd expect in a regular RPG. No obnoxious level cap that forces you to fuse Digimon and grind the new one up over and over again. And while yes, there is grinding in this game, it doesn't feel as obnoxious. In items like the Counter Crest trivializes some fights, so you may not even have to grind all that much. That said, the difficulty took a nosedive. There isn't really any strategy to fights other than just bulldozing your opponents. Status elements are there, but tend to be used more as a nuisance by random Digimon than getting any use from bosses. It doesn't help that status effects disappear outside of battle, so there's no urgency to get healed or cure your team like in Pokemon. The story was a step in the right direction, as things get going a lot faster and you're not just drip-fed information over dozens of hours. Sure, it's a little cliche at first, but the AOA taking over the game and planning to rule the world wasn't too bad of an idea. It reminds me a little too much of Mega Man Battle Network. What with a terrorist organization trying to take over the online world in order to rule the real world. Which is kind of funny since the game got so much criticism for being a Pokemon ripoff back in the day. I think some of its twists come completely out of nowhere and have no real buildup. The reveal of the true villain behind everything probably being the best example. And it feels like it doesn't really take advantage of its setting of being trapped in an online game. There aren't any strange glitches or a cheeky UI that reminds you you're playing a game about being in a game. There are cutscenes set in the real world, but you never actually go there or interact with it in any way. You could cut out the beginning of the game where the kids log in and say that humans and Digimon have made settlements in the digital world together. And it would have worked the same. I think the game's biggest problem is, of course, the padding. I went over it quite a bit earlier, so I won't rehash all of my points. But good god, it's just so frustrating to have the game toss you around all over the map to complete some bullshit task. And then you have to do it again barely 30 minutes to an hour later. The lack of fast travel just makes it so much worse. Like Digimon World 2, it really feels like the devs wanted this to be a longer game in the vein of other, and frankly much better RPGs. But they couldn't come up with an interesting story that would justify an extended runtime. So instead it just wastes your time between plot beats in order to artificially extend the runtime. Out of the original trilogy, 3 is the best in terms of approachability, design, and difficulty. I know they would more or less use this same design for some of the DS Digimon World games, which I've never played. But I'm curious if they ironed out some of the bigger problems or not. While Digimon World 3 is a serviceable Digimon game, it really feels like a lackluster RPG. And after having replayed it for this video, I don't consider it the best of the original trilogy. As a kid, I would have ranked them like this. With Digimon World 2 as the best, 3 in second, and 1 in last. Now as an adult, and having replayed all 3 games again in the last year, I'd rank them like this. With 1 as my favorite of the trilogy, 3 in second, and 2 a distant third. While I'm not a fan of how newbie unfriendly the first game is, once you know what you're doing, the game is really fun. You get attached to your Digimon, raising them and training them up, genuinely feeling sad when they inevitably pass away, and gain a sense of accomplishment as you slowly build File City. Out of the three, it feels the most unique, as a fairly open world to explore and with plenty to do once you've built up the city. Two and three have their strong points, like I said, being easier and more approachable. The problem is both are held back by lots of busy work, padding and grinding. Understanding the basics of what makes an RPG, but not doing much to stand out. And offering experiences stretched too long for their rather bare bones plot. Around this time is when Digimon as a franchise would start to go in decline here in the States, and where I started to fall off the series myself. The next two Digimon World games on the PS2 weren't looked at as favorably by critics or fans, and I never played them myself. But reactions to Digimon World 4 does make me think it's as bad as others say. Let me know if you ever want me to submit myself to that in a future video. Hell, I didn't play a new Digimon game until the release of Cyber Sleuth in 2015. And as for the anime, Digimon Season 4 or Digimon Frontier would debut a few months after this game's release. I don't remember seeing any marketing for it or kids at school talking about it. Maybe there were fans online talking about it. But I was 12 and hadn't joined any type of message board yet. But I stumbled across it completely by accident one day 
The show appearing on UPN on weekday mornings of all things, usually squeezed between Tarzan the Animated Series and Sonic Underground. I had no clue why it wasn't on Fox Kids like the last three seasons, but now I realize it was most likely because of 4Kids TV. So that exact same year, Fox would ditch 4Kids and their kids Saturday TV block would be called 4Kids TV instead, featuring cartoons and anime dubbed exclusively by 4Kids Entertainment. You know, Yu-Gi-Oh, Ultimate Muscle, Sonic X, or ugh, One Piece. And after Frontier, the anime series would disappear for four years before finally returning with Digimon Savers, aka Digimon Data Squad in 2006. Digimon games have had their ups and downs over the last two decades. While never quite reaching the glory of Pokemon, were still fun experiences that tried to set themselves apart from the competition, though not always sticking or landing. While I've had my nostalgia wiped away replaying these games, it was fun to return to a trilogy that I enjoyed so much as a kid, even if the cracks in the games were a lot easier to see now as an adult. I'm eager to try out some of the games I've missed since then, and who knows, I might even find some real gems. But for now, I'm ready for a break from the world of Digimon. And that's the video. Thanks for watching, guys. This video took a bit longer to make than I was expecting. I wanted to pace myself for a change and not feel rushed to complete a video. I took that time to refine the script and flesh out more about what I wanted to cover, though I wasn't expecting the video to be this long either. Huge thanks to JG over on Twitter for the awesome thumbnail for this video. I'll link his bio in the description, definitely check out his art. Next video is well underway now, and it's a follow up to my GTA 4 retrospective. Now covering episodes from Liberty City. I'm hoping this next one won't be as long as that video, so I may do one video covering The Lost and the Damned, and the other covering The Ballad of Gay Tony. With summer in full swing and my day job slowing down a ton, I'm hoping to get a few more videos out in the next couple of months. Again, thanks for watching guys. If you enjoyed my video, I'd appreciate it if you left a like and comment down below. Which part of the Digimon World Trilogy is your favorite? Do you want me to review any of the PS2 games? And for that matter, which season of Digimon is your favorite? My favorite season 3, aka Digimon Tamers. And if you're new to my channel, I'd appreciate it if you subscribed. I'm Fuzzy Slippers, and I'll see you later. Peace.